Old and privileged to be hosting this this morning and kind of knowing what's kind of on the agenda and seeing some of it, I think you're going to find it very fascinating, very interesting, very useful in terms of next steps and all of the work that still needs to be done. You know, we, we champion um, diversity at the home and women in music and very much part of, of our agenda moving forward, so feel very passionately about that. I'm not going to say anything else because I'm going to hand over to the fantastic founder of the Donne Foundation, Gabriella. So I'm going to hand over and enjoy this morning. I tell you, I can sing to 2,000 people, but this is hard. <laughs> well, first of all, um, a very big thank you to all of you for being here this morning to what I hope it will be an inspiring, productive, and one of those puts a fire in your belly kind of morning. And before I say anything, I just want to say a huge Thanks to Lucy. Where did you go? She left. Lucy <laughs> and the whole oh hi and the whole team here at the Royal Albert Hall for hosting us, for being extremely supportive of everything uh, that made this event a reality. Also, a huge thanks to all the researchers involved in putting this report together. Uh, they can't be here, uh, they are all over the world. Uh, Anne, Julia, Julia, Molly, our data analyst, uh, Ailey and Mira, who designed this beautiful report, and Isabel, who is our artist, who creates this amazing art for us. Thank you. We wouldn't have done it without you. Um. Before I say anything else, I have notes because otherwise I talk non-stop. Um, I would like to show you a very short video uh, that just tells you, for some people who don't know us very well, uh, a little bit more about the work done by the Donne Foundation. Well, um, I realize I haven't introduced myself properly. Um, I am Gabriella Di Laccio. I am a soprano and also the founder and director of the Donne Foundation. I'm just saying Donne, like women in Italian. Some people call us Don. It's not a problem. <laughs> but I just, I'm here today. So anyway, 
some of you must have heard the story, you know, Brazilian soprano walks on the South Bank market on a Sunday under the bridge uh, and goes in one of those outside stands and finds an encyclopedia called the International Encyclopedia of Women Composers. The life work of Aaron Cohen, published in the 80s, where he listed 6,000 women composers in the history of music. She goes home feeling extremely ignorant, tries to avoid eye contact with any of her colleagues in the meantime until she does some homework and starts to discovering amazing music, amazing stories of women. Honestly, she's overwhelmingly annoying and I mean, excited <laughs> at, at this point, I tell you. Until one morning, her lovely husband says to her, look, are you gonna tell me another story of a woman and her music? or are you gonna do something about it? So she decided to do something about it. And four years and a half later, she stands here in front of you all, much less ignorant, slightly angrier. <laughs> you see, we've been talking about equality for quite a long time for decades, for centuries now. And I know that everybody here in this room has spent time to improve, to dedicate, to learn more. And conversations like the one we're having today are crucial, important, but they are not enough anymore. Because in the 21st century, we can't have excuses like, the canon is the canon. Sorry, that's me trying to do a funny accent. Or, we do blackface in opera because it's the tradition. Or, there has not been enough women composers in the history of music to produce enough music to be compared with the great masters. Whose fault is that, right? But once again, wrong assumption. Because I, I'm not an academic, as you all know, I'm a soprano. I can tell you that I can find very quickly 10,000 pieces by women to bring this report to a 50%. And guess what? The audiences would love every single one of them. <laughs> the phrase, the phrase uh, if you can't measure, you can't improve it, has been said many times. It's almost a mantra. And, but there is a reason why this phrase is repeated so often. It's true. <laughs> and when we look at the data, even though if we want to focus on the positives, we can see that there is still a lot of work to be done. Um, you all have a copy of the report. If you haven't seen it, it's inside the list of bag in front of you. So I'm not going to go through everything, but I just would like to highlight a couple of points before we start our lovely panels. So. Gerard, here we go. Uh, so this year, we uh, looked into the repertoire uh, scheduled by 111 orchestras all over the world. This has been an improvement from <laughs> when we began in 2018, the beginning of this small project. So when I looked into the 15 orchestras only, and at that time, 2018-19, only 2.3% of the works presented were composed by women. A uh, small in improvement on 2019-2020 it moved to 3.6% uh, of all the works composed uh, by women composers. And then we moved to, oh, no, no, yes. Uh, <laughs> last year, we managed to improve to 100 orchestras. And then again, uh, improvement, we went to up to 5% of the works composed by women. Uh, but then we also start looking uh, a little bit about uh, diversity. And then you can see that only 1.11% of the works were composed by black and Asian women. This year, we, uh, once again, we uh, improved to 11 and 100 orchestras, as you know. And another improvement, 7.7% of the works were written uh, by women. But now I would like to ask you uh, to just look at this from a different point of view. And that means that 9.2 out of 10 compositions were written by men. 8.8 .8 out of 10 were written by white men. And 7.6 of 10 
compositions were written by historical white men. Um, here they are, the 10 most performed composers, faces we all know. Um, we love all of you, don't worry. We're not taking you down. Uh, but, you know, if you just think 27.5 of the old pieces were composed by these 10, four times more than all pieces by women altogether. Some other fun facts. Beethoven and Brahms together accounted for more performance than all women composers combined. Uh, Mozart and Strauss roughly for all global majority composers combined. And Tchaikovsky performed as often as all black composers combined. And the winner, Beethoven, we love you. Um, but come on, give us a break. Uh, Florence Price was the woman uh, with the most works scheduled. She had her works scheduled 61 times. And 2.1% of all the pieces were performed by these 10 women. Um, before uh, I move, I think now we need to look why is this still a problem? Because when you look at diversity, then we can see that, hey, so much work we have to do. Because 1.02% uh, of the works were written by black women. 0.66 by Asian women, 0.31 by mixed heritage women, 0.05 by Middle Eastern women, 0.09 by indigenous women. And in the report, you see uh, things in, in more uh, detail as well. And the situation is not much different for men. Only 2.37 of the works were composed by black men, 1.11 by Asian men, 0.52 mixed heritage men, 0.33 by Middle Eastern men and 0.06 by indigenous men. Um, let's go back to some good things, right? So we have some great examples. Um, the Chicago Sinfonietta with a fantastic 50-50. And, uh, you know, the more colorful the charts are, it means diversity is great. So uh, when you only see one color, it's not so great. So uh, you can see Chicago, Chicago Sinfonietta, 50-50, great diversity. The National Philharmonic in USA as well, 40-60 gender balance and uh, diversity as well. The London Contemporary Orchestra as well, 38%. Uh, women, 57 by men, but a lot of diversity there. And Chineke, as usual, uh, showing a lot of inc in inclusion and diversity in the works they perform. Uh, I'm almost done. Before I am, uh, I would like to ask you a very important question is... The next slide. Yeah. So please, when you credit this report, please make sure you link to it. Please make sure you uh, tag our names and, and give pro proper um, credit to it because it's such a hard work and we just want this to go as far as we can and reach as many people as possible. Thank you very much and I would like to open the floor for Helen and these amazing composers who are going to start the session. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to invite to the stage our composers panel. So our composers in the room, we have Arlene Sierra, Bushra El Turk, Ella Jarman Pinto and Nicola Lefanu, please welcome to the stage. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to have such diversity of voices in the room because this is all about learning how we can keep making things better, but not just satelliting in and out, but having sustained change so it is persistent and it will continue. And as Gabrielle has shown over the reports, this work is needed, but it's needed with long-term investment of people, energies, passion, as well as the financial resource that's needed behind. But fundamentally, we need to hear from the experience in the room. So we've got some um, short questions for each panel. But ideally, I'm just going to ask two questions. And if I take them separately, we can hear from all of you and try and share the wonderful experience that you all have. So thank you. Um, 
What we're really interested to start with then is to hear about the barriers of the experiences you have had as women composers working actively in the field. I don't mind you taking a moment to think. You've all got a microphone. We could go in turn. We could all just chip in. You're smiling at me though, Alice. So why don't I start with you? Is that okay? <laughs> so let's start with the experience of uh, any barriers that you have um, witnessed, experienced yourself. Okay, I think I'm going first. Um, <laughs> um, I feel like, for me, the experiences that I've had are so subtle of, of the barriers. They're subtle. It's in the, um, you know, the way that someone has spoken to you and you go, not sure that that was respectful, but I'm going to have to think about it. Um, it's in, um, you know, silence. It's in not hearing from people or it's in you know making connections and then seeing that actually your name has been missed off somewhere where actually you think you would really really work in that recital or um i think it's just this kind of mild um invisibility that at the same time doesn't quite make sense because of your experience or because of you know the networks you're putting out. Um, so I feel like, yeah, the barriers feel really, 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 really subtle, really nuanced. Um, and I suppose in, in a way that is a, a privilege from what I assume it used to be. Um, my mother wanted to be a composer and she asked the careers officer, I would like to be a composer. And the careers advisor basically said, why don't you be a composer's secretary? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, she did make her life from music, but, you know, so I, th there is that improvement that it's really, really nuanced. Um, I mean, there are some very, uh, some experiences that are very, very um, uh, obvious, and those ones are sometimes harder to come back from. But, um, yeah, it really feels like things don't make sense, things aren't adding up with what I know about myself and the way I work, but at the same time, it, it leads me to this conclusion that there are barriers that are happening because of my gender, because of my race. It sounds not only emotionally taxing, but you've had to build up a lot of resilience to keep going, to keep fighting and making the change, just as Gabrielle has actually said, to keep putting yourself out there. And I know in previous conversations about women's access to music, women's musical leadership, there's a whole issue of voluntary labour, um, and that labour being ignored being silenced as well just as you said not being credited as well does that sound a fair comment um it is very emotionally taxing um i've certainly you know to be really really honest i have been kind of going what am i doing as with this as a career um i know it's the thing that that i want to do for the rest of my life and it really lights me up but then you look at you know all of the programming that's happening and you're saying so everyone says there's no money for me but actually there's plenty of money, but you're just recycling the same thing. So it's like, there is plenty to go around, there is plenty of opportunity for all of the composers, for all of the performers, you know, who really want to have an equal say at the table or an equitable say at the table, I think where we are now. Um, but it's just, it's, it's taken for, like you say, those 10 composers, that elite few. Thank you. I'm going to keep moving around the panel if that's okay, and then we'll keep coming around. Is that all right if I ask yes, you the yeah. same question about your barriers experienced? Um, it's, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, there's, there's a kind of less subtle, isn't there, as well? I mean, I've gotten e emails or invitations saying, oh, we want you because you're a woman and because you have Middle Eastern heritage or, and be, you know. Uh, you will tick our box. <laughs> um, so there's the kind of obvious, like, oh, so if I wasn't those things, would I still <laughs> be invited to this based on the merit and, you know. Um, it's, it's, it is hard to know why, I mean, I guess in my experience, in my, I guess in the last 15 years of my professional life, um, I've been invited to things 
mostly because of the trends that have uh, emerged in the, in the organ within the festivals and organizations and the music scene. So, uh, oh, here's an, you know, Arab women composers, let's celebrate that. Okay, so lots of commissions there that year. Um, women composers, yeah, great, uh, lots of commissions that year, and then you don't hear anything because there's no celebration for any of those things. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. So when, when then you do, when you're, I guess you're profiled uh, with other mainstream contemporary voices, um, without being labeled, then you know that there, ha there is, that, you know, well, at least you feel it um, and think there is something good here and I'm not being, I'm not, I don't have all these labels before my name. Language and representation yes, is really language, powerful, yeah. isn't it, about how we market, how we sell a program as well. I think that's really powerful. And again, the emotional side, the resilience is coming through very strongly in what you've said. And I, I know everyone in the room will say keep going, but it's, it does take a lot of personal investment as well, which is why sharing these experiences are so important, because we've all got the different ones. Do you mind if I come to you next? Right. Um, well, I think all composers need tremendous resilience to keep going, but women especially, because of all those hidden hidden prejudices. Very few people nowadays are outwardly misogynistic, but without realizing it, they do hold, hold unspoken prejudices. As for barriers, it might be useful to point, my mother was the composer Elizabeth McConkie, and there's a wonderful film that Donna and Music made about her, which you can watch, one of their composer videos. And you can see very clearly there how at the beginning of her career, she had a great deal of success. She did face barriers because publishers wouldn't pl publish music by a woman, but nevertheless, she was played at the proms and championed. But then, after the Second World War, there was a real backlash against women, and she was extremely patronized by other musical organizations and, and performed very little. And then right at the end of her life, she was once again performed and, and acclaimed. Uh, and you can even see this pattern continuing because there was a lot of performance in her centenary of uh, 2007, and then once again, she wasn't played very much. And then suddenly, just as you're saying, it became, we must play women. Every orchestra had to tick a box. And suddenly there was lots of McConkey being played and broadcast. And I'm delighted about that, because always the most important thing is the music is heard. Because once somebody has heard a piece of music, they can't say any longer, well, there aren't any suitable pieces we can program. Because that lack of knowledge of the repertoire is usually you know, half, half the problem. As for myself, well, clearly I was very lucky uh, being born the daughter of a professional composer. So it never occurred to me that it was unusual for women to compose. I mean, my mother's close friends were the Welsh composer Grace Williams, the Irish composer Ina Boyle. These were, these were my initial role models. Um, so I didn't have barriers at the beginning of my career, and I was very fortunate in that. In that sort of, when you hit middle age, all composers will tell you, you know, you're no longer fashionable. It's not age before beauty, it's beauty before age every time. Um, but what happened to me was I began to work with some wonderful women, uh, women stage directors, uh, women festival managers, and that enabled me to write my operas and have them staged. But that was, that was definitely due to really feisty women out there who weren't afraid to champion uh, somebody. Um, so I would say the barriers probably increased for me as I got older, um, but channeling that resilience, I hope I, hope I have managed to, to meet most of them, if not all. I think you've met a lot of them. And just to add to what you said, I think the legacy you've spoken about, both of your mother and of your work, is really important. It was your mother's work that I first heard as a woman composer during my degree. So without that experience, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now as an academic either. But that means we all have a responsibility to share, to talk, and keep these names alive, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, <laughs> for the first question. Yeah. Um, well, it's hard to follow <laughs> someone like Nicola, for sure. Um, I think, it, it, I mean, it's amazing, it's miraculous in a way to see all these uh, kind of efforts, all those boxes to tick. I mean, the fact that there are even boxes to tick kind of shocks me because, you know, all through my studies in the first, you know, few years of my career that 
that just didn't exist. And, and I think not having had, I mean, well, my mother's an artist, a painter, so, I mean, her struggles have been massive as well. Um, but I didn't have many role models until I, until I started studying. Um, and I studied with some incredible women composers who I found absolutely terrifying. It was sort of like um, <laughs> like all the teenage angst a daughter would have toward her mother, but times a thousand because it's the, it's the career you want, you know. So, so, um, so uh, Betsy Jolis was one, the first woman I studied with when I was 22, I think, doing my master's. And I was so afraid of her. Um, <laughs> but she was, she was wonderful, and just her existence met, meant so much to me. Um, and actually, later on, it sort of panned out, because she's a dual national, and I am too, Britain and the US. Uh, she's in France and the US. So, um, but it took years to kind of get over that fear of sort of disapproval by somebody that I admired so much. But her experience, and I'm sure yours, once you got out of your mother's shadow, were probably very similar to mine. And, and it was something that my, my young son has pointed out, seeing pictures of my student days and my early festivals and things. Like, well, it's just mommy and a bunch of guys. Mommy and a bunch of guys. Oh, there's another, you know, it's like every cohort I was in, it was me and a bunch of guys, you know, and, and I mean, I was actually, I was brought up to be in a very feminist household and brought up to be very forthright um, in a way that many of my students are really not. Um, so I guess I was better equipped, but I had that pressure all the time while studying. Like I would sit in a seminar and Seriously, Lucas Foss or Luciano Barrio would be speaking, you know, and, and I would think, if I don't ask a question, if I don't say something, there will not have been one woman speaking for these entire three hours. You know, so I had that awareness and that pressure all through, you know, my coming up and through my career. And I must say, I mean, only in the last three or four years, have I been on panels with other women? It's just like, you know, every, every kind of, you know, premiere festival kind of big to do where the composers are interviewed after, afterwards or before the performance, it's me and a bunch of guys, you know. Um, so one is used to it, but it's tiring, you know, and, and it should not be this way anymore. I'm so delighted that it's, you know, being talked about and, and measured. <laughs> um, you know, it's about time. But you know, growing up like that, I, I had a certain horror of women composer festivals, and women, you know, I did not want to be marginalized. You know, I wanted to be in there with the guys. You know, I I knew that they weren't any better than I was. So, it. it but again, that that pressure and that worry, you know, I maybe as a student, you know, 20 years ago, I would have had, you know, some reticence about being on an all women panel <laughs> in a way, um, and I'm so delighted that's changed. And it takes confidence to be able to say, I'm as good as anyone else in the experience. But one thing you've all made me think of with this, if you don't mind me just acting as a mirror here, that we, as women or anyone that's underrepresented, don't just need somebody to step and say, we need representation, we need advocates. And I'm thinking there's leadership research out there. Deborah Road comes to mind. Laura and I and our project's been looking at. She says, women don't just need mentors. We do need mentors, but we need advocates to open the door. So you don't just have the tick box policy, because that's one way to break down some barriers as well. We could speak for hours on that topic, but I'm going to be the boring one to move us to the second question and keep us on time, if that's okay. We don't have to keep going in the same order. Please don't let me pressurize you. This could be more conversational between you. The second question is really to think about what ventures or activities you have witnessed that have improved the representation of women and improved it in an authentic or an equitable way. I'll let you think for a minute. You might say there isn't. You might say there are some things that have been useful. <laughs> Please, Nicola. Thank you. Inevitably, I need to talk about um, 1987 when the organization Women in Music was founded. Thank you. Sorry. I need to talk about 1987, which was the year that the organization Women in Music was founded. Because I think the most important th message I would want to send, about, send away with people today is that there's a long history of cycles where, for a brief time, women are in the spotlight and have lots of opportunity, and then the spotlight goes off and women no longer have those opportunities. So that 
all this morning when we were talking about how we can make change, we're talking about making lasting change so as to break those cycles. And that's why I mentioned 1987, because in the 60s and 70s in this country, there was a lot of opportunity for composers who happened to be female. Less for people who were not white and you know, all that, but nevertheless, there was in the 60s and still through the 70s, more diversity and, and really quite good quotes, equality from a gender point of view. As the country became more conservative and we entered the Thatch years and so on, that all vanished. And in early, in I guess 1986, I took three months off from composing and I just researched it uh, in the way that we have the research today, because unless you've got absolutely correct figures, no one will listen. And I showed how women had completely fallen off the radar and it was just the white male. And we had a festival organized by men and women called the Hidden Sounds. It was here in London, Camden Festival, South Bank. Um, it was a great festival. People heard wonderful repertoire, which should have been being played all the time. Uh, and I gave a paper with all these statistics showing how disgraceful it was. And for about five, maybe seven years, there was a tremendous change. And that organization, Women in Music, was funded by the Arts Council. They lobbied. Um, we, we got women onto boards. We had women working at the BBC, we had women working at the Arts Council, women were in positions of power, none of which had been the case in the 80s. And then very gradually, it all disappeared. And it was no longer fashionable, it was not modish, the Arts Council didn't want to fund women in music anymore. Uh, and so on and so on, so we had voluntary people doing things. And then, I mean, most of us who'd been originally involved with it had passed it to the younger generation, which is what you need to do. Uh, and some of them persevered but there was such a notable change. So I was very thrilled when over the last perhaps seven years, once again, it seemed that particularly young women composers were being given lots of opportunity. And then with the advent of Chiniki and people's much greater awareness of the degree to which this country was still not just class ridden, but, but real racial prejudice all through, there was clearly a big improvement happening. My fear is always that we get stuck in this cyclic pattern, <coughs> where, as you say, people tick boxes and then the box goes away because it's no longer modish. So, yeah, 87 was a great year and good things happened, but we have to watch out. It's a powerful message, isn't it, about sustainability. Thank you, really powerful. Can I open it out to anybody else on the panel? Any other experiences that you've witnessed? And if you're angry, like Gabriella just said, you can share that as well and share a question of why did this not happen at an event? If we've got the opposite that we've witnessed, we could share that. <laughs> Please. Um, it's incredible to have that perspective because, you know, 1987 it seems like a long time ago and, and so many things that, you know, you think never happened actually did happen and, and nobody tells you. And it just shows that that, that cycle is something that needs to be fought. Um, I, I guess what, what I, I know it's not enough because I know it's happened before, but I, what I would like to see more of is women getting the big gigs. Um, you know, the, op the operas, the, <laughs> you know, symphonic works, residencies, things with real permanence. Um, and, and not, you know, it, it just, Getting, getting commissioned for, you know, a three-minute concert opener is not, you know, uh, how many, actually, I think it has been done for other global surveys of what the durations are of pieces by women. Um, and this is a really big one because, you know, they're taking a box in the cheapest, easiest, most harmless way possible by having a three-minute concert opener. And then, you know, another half an hour piece by Dvorak, you know, so it, it this, this is what really matters. I mean, for me, as, as a younger woman composer, you know, to see, you know, operas by Judith Weir fully staged in London, you know, meant a huge amount. I mean, I saw two operas by Judith, who was a very important mentor and friend now. Um, but, you know, I also saw about, what, 15 by Burt Whistle, you know, over the same decade. So, you know, you know, if you could have, you know, more women composers, you know, at the pinnacles of real careers, you know, getting more than a tiny percentage of what 
the big guys are getting. And again, I'm talking about living composers now. Um, and, and from a personal standpoint, I, I just finished a residency with the Utah Symphony in the United States. And, you know, probably it was only possible because somebody pointed out to them that they had, had maybe three works by women in the last decade. But they commissioned a symphonic scale piece for me and they played you know, two other huge pieces of mine. They, uh, they had me write a piece for the local youth orchestra. I met with school groups. I, I did all that stuff over a year. And it was a phenomenal experience um, for me artistically and, and as a human just to do all those things. Um, but, you know, composers at my level who are men have done these things like 50 times, you know? It was, it was the first time for me. Um, and why is that? Well, you know, I, that, that's what gets me thinking now that I'm mid-career and I've done a good number of very established things is that, you know, it's sort of still a given for the men of a certain age and stature to have these things, but for the women, it still absolutely is not. And that needs to change. It's an inspiring story, and one thing we need to do is inspire others to encourage the programming, encourage the scale of work, and not just the small works. I'm very conscious of time, I really am, but I'm going to say one minute in case there's anything urgent for experience we need to add, because I can see you're desperate. So I'm taking liberties. I might be shouted at later, but please. <laughs> mm. I mean, I think for me, um, I've, I've had a lot of very small scale commissions, um, and the the... The experiences that I've had professionally that have really been positive are, are ones that people understand my commitments. They understand I have children. They understand I have, therefore, time boundaries in order to, you know, you know um, in order to kind of live my life and be a decent parent and a decent human being and not, you know, die from stress. Um, but also, you know, but then trust that at the end I'm going to get them something. And, you know, and trust me as a person. Um, the experiences that I've had that have been really negative are where you have someone who pretends to trust and creates what they then call a safe environment and then completely destroy that environment. And that, I feel like, is the hardest... Um, that's the hardest kind of environment to work in. But when you get the, the, the people who really are like... I like your music, I like you, um, you know, whether we get on or not, you know, I like your music, I trust you, here's the money, give me a piece, this is the deadline, let's talk about it, and they know I will come back to them, All that real trust, um, and then it's performed, and because the trust is there, you get the best music, because my mind is not taken up going, do they like me, or is this happening, or are they, like, being disrespectful, or, you know, I'm, I'm really focusing on, on music for them, and um, that, for me, is the absolute key to it all. Um, and that's hugely lacking. Thank you. Trust is a very powerful word. And having trust in Gabby smiling at me, I'm going to wrap up this session because of timing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let me walk away and just leave these wonderful women looking so we can applaud these lovely four women. <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm moving slightly away to say we've got some time for some questions from the floor, which is really important. Um, I'm pretty sure there's another mobile mic walking around as well, which is great, but I'm also happy to move. So um, any questions for our wonderfully inspiring panel behind me? I'm coming. <laughs> We're on a race to get to the back. <laughs> um, hi there. Um, there's not a single thing that I disagree with that all four of you have said. Is there also another thing that particularly I'm, no, I'm worried about in the future that could be even more of a, a divide? And that's, why I think, what I'm sorry, I didn't know your name, the daughter of Elizabeth McConkie. What well, you pointed to class in, in Britain. And I... I'm, I'm quite posh, but I went to state schools which had terrible music education. And I'm noticing now it's been stripped away even more. The arts is not deemed very relevant. And so in about 20 years' time, who are going to be the audiences? Or even if we hopefully achieve gender 
diversity is going to be from a very, very small, presumably privately educated sector, and that's both audiences and composers. Uh, is there any sort of movement to address state education and, and love of the arts across society? Thank you so much, Nicola. Um, my name's Deborah Nets, and I'm chief exec at the ISM. Uh, ISM has been doing a huge amount of campaigning in relation to music education. We produced two reports this year that you should read. One is called Music in Peril, uh, which shows that in some state schools, um, the budget per pupil is one pound per head per annum. And you can't do a lot with that. Um, by comparison, private schools are incredibly well funded. We then looked at the state of the workforce, um, and what we found is that peripatetics, and very often they are female, are now on zero hour contracts. They're casualized. There's no guarantee they're going to get work. And frankly, I don't know how they're going to be able to keep up with their mortgage payments. So that is where music education is. It is slipping out of our state schools. So it will just become the preserve of the wealthy. Now, we have been talking to the government about this 10, 15 years. We have seen absolutely no change around the accountability measures, which is what is primarily pushing music out of schools. So until there is a change in government policy around education, I think we have a significant problem. So it comes to all of us, I think, to advocate for music education in the same way that we need to advocate for gender diversity and all other forms of diversity, because government will not change. So we have to be the change. And I'm just looking around the room in case we have one more question before we move to the second panel. Right behind me, apologies. Hi, Hi my name's Ellie, I'm from Orchestras for All. Thank you so much. It's been a really, really fantastic to hear about your personal experiences. Um, my question is about, I think um, it's so important that we diversify the, the programming and everything that you've said is yeah, completely spot on. When I've had conversations with people, especially working in quite big orchestras, um, my impression is that the, one of the biggest fears is around ticket sales and marketing. And that's quite often the response I get when I ask, like, why aren't you diversifying your programming? Why aren't you <laughs> performing more um, uh, underrepresented composers? And I think that is the most common response I get, is that the marketeers are absolutely terrified. The CEOs are terrified. And especially after the pandemic, my understanding is that there's a huge stress and anxiety around ticket sales this year in particular. Um, what, what was your response to that? What would you say? How, because obviously in, part of the problem there is actually prejudice and, sex and sexism potentially faced by audiences as well as within our sector. So how do we go about tackling that one? Um, if you're happy for me to... Yeah, for me, um, certainly when I was studying, there was a lot of fear over the dwindling of classical audiences. Um, and as far as I'm aware, again, I don't have the stats on this, but as far as I'm aware, that problem is not something that's been solved. So obviously something isn't working, and often fear um, is something that gets in the way of change and improvement. But there have been so many... There, I'm, I'm talking off the top of my head, but I know that there have been so many ex examples of people saying, okay, I need to stop being afraid and just do it. And they do it and the audiences come. You know, if I am to see that there is a program that is not tokenistic, you know, you can see a tokenistic program from, you know, 100 miles away. But if I can see a program that's not tokenistic, that really feels genuine and authentic and really, really um, inclusive, I'm like, I want to be there. I want to go and listen to music by people who I relate to, who look like me, who have similar life experiences because I have not felt represented, you know, the entirety of my um, training and my professional career. So I want to see that. They gain my seat, you know, and if they lose a couple of seats, then actually, 
what are you gaining versus what are you losing? Are you losing the past and gaining the future? I feel like it's, it's, a, it's an easy excuse. And it, it's actually, hi, <laughs> it's actually not, it doesn't pan out that, that you lose audiences by doing this. It's, it's how it's marketed and I think more importantly in my own experience, the advocacy, the, 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 the belief of conductors, of soloists, and, and the integrity of how they program, mm -hmm. because you can integrate, <laughs> well, that's the word, um, you know, programming old and new and, and historical and diverse in, in so many creative ways. You know, as, as surveys show us and history shows us, there is no shortage of fantastic music by every kind of person. Um, and it's there, but it, it, it takes the advocacy of the people performing it, presenting it, performing it. Um, and when it happens, and I've seen it happen, the audiences are so thrilled and moved. You know, the, the, the ancient subscribers and the, the new kids, you know, they, they, can, they can be in the same audience and, and cheering and really getting everything out of, you know, the Dvorak and the new piece and the weird concerto they never thought they'd hear, you know, and all these things. Um, it really can, can work. I think it's just the people who make programming decisions have to stop being lemmings, you know, and, and really use integrity. I, I, Hello, hello, hello. Hi. I remember the first time I, I, I met Nicola, I asked her to do a, an interview for us, for Donne, when we just started. And I asked her because uh, suddenly everybody started asking me like, oh, why is this happening? Why is this music not being played? As if I would know the answer. So I did ask her like, so Nicola, what do you think? And then she still gave me the, the, the greatest answer ever. And she said, well, there is a huge ignorance of the repertoire, number one. And people who are putting these programs together, they are nice people, of course they are, but they have limited time. And the, because they don't know, there's no time to research. And then we end up in the same thing. But uh, I think uh, she's such a nice person. And uh, I think I urge, the, the, I think the, what we have to think is like, if you are a marketing uh, director in, in an orchestra or in any organization, your job is to, market something, right, is to really sell that uh, to new audiences. And as, as, as Arlene said, and there's no concert I do, and I, you know, I've been premiering music by women for the past years, and nobody knows the piece until they come. There's never a person in the audience who says, oh, I'm off can't hear this, no, it's the opposite. Everybody comes and say, this is amazing. I never heard about this composer. Where can I find out more? So it's really a choice. And I think what we are missing is decision. Just decide you're gonna do it and do it. That's it. Very well said. I'm gonna be the boring one to the time and we're gonna move on to the second panel. I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Claire. Thank you, thanks. So can I invite my panel to the chat, to the stage, please? Can we have Vic and Sharice and Stephen and Ellie and Eleanor. Thank you. So um, we've just been touching on our next question a little bit about longevity and sustainability and being the change and lasting change. So we're going to have a bit more of a discussion around how can we encourage more long-term change, what barriers there might be that we need to overcome. We're going to hear from our expert panel who all bring different perspectives from their corners of the music world. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, in recent years, there have been some great examples of programmes and campaigns that have advocated for long-term change and some of those you've all been involved in and we hope that they're on their way to achieving lasting change. Um, this year's Black History Month theme is Time for Change, Action, Not Words. So ensuring that there's a better tomorrow starts with learning from the past, but also, importantly, as we've just heard, taking decisive action that can have a long-term impact. But what are those necessary conditions for lasting change to happen? 
And how can you encourage a movement away from those tick boxes and short-termist thinking? That's our debate for this morning. Vic, I'm going to start off with you. Vic's a music industry professional with many strings to her bow, including strategic business management consultancy, diversity and inclusion consultant with a grounding in research. She's a PhD candidate at Queen Mary University of London, as well as founder of the F List. So can I start with you as your kind of groundbreaking research collect counting the music industry and the initiation of the not-for-profit collective, the F List, have both have long-term goals of change married with some very short-term and decisive action. What conditions have you come across that are vital for long-term change? And with that, who needs to be in the room? That's such a big, big question, isn't it? Thank you very much. Um, uh, Claire. So uh, my research is grounded in organizational uh, business management and you know we might be in the music industry but we are still businesses and the key thing in the change management research is leadership. Leaders need to be in the room. There are leaders here in this in this room and up on, on stage and it can't, it can't just be a cyclical thing, as, as Nicola pointed out. It, it, it can't just be one person's passion project, and when they run out of time and energy and money, it, uh, that project stops. It has, it has to be a concerted effort by the leaders, the CEOs, the managing directors of the orchestras, the funders, the, ven the venues. Uh, they have to properly commit to it. It can't just be something that you did last year, as I've been told by quite a few organizations. Oh, my board did diversity last year. And I'm, I'm sorry, you know, it's something that you have to be embedding into your strategy long term. Thanks, Vic. And um, we can pick up on that in a, again in a minute and we could get into sort of more leadership conversations. But Sharice, um, you've got over 13 years experience of brand creation and delivering market innovation and is co-founder of Black Lives and Music, which addresses the current inequality of opportunity for black, Asian and ethnically diverse people, aspiring to be artists or professionals in the jazz and classical music industry. So you've continued this drive for better evidence with Black Lives and Music, publishing their inaugural study last year. Um, in, in terms of your experience in the last two years in particular, who have you found most useful in the room and what have you been able to do in terms of in, embedding and encouraging that lasting change with some of the people that have signed up to join Black Lives in Music? That's a really good question. Um, do you mind if I go for it? <laughs> go for it. Do you know what? It's because I was reading a report this morning and like my friend Gabriella said, you can't help but be a little bit angry when you read it. And just looking at the stats, not just what was shown, but even the orchestras, um, you know, the top tier of, the top set of orchestras were the BBC ones, which weren't colorful enough, as you said, Gabriella. And um, it just shows that there's a lot of work to do um, we are having those conversations, thankfully. We have some partners alongside me and in the room. And what that will and that desire for change is definitely there. So we're definitely grateful for that. But just seeing what we've seen in the report today in regards to certain orchestras not even being in the room. So we've actually spoke to the majority of the people that I'm speaking to now, you guys. And, you know, we've been able to make a case and advocacy for black people in the music industry, black composers as well. And, you know, we're seeing some change. We're developing programs. We've got one um, even here at the Royal Albert Hall, but also with the Royal Opera House. We're working with, um, I believe, nearly 20 orchestras across the country to actually create mentoring programs, recruitment pathways, Ulster Orchestra in Northern Ireland, which are an awesome orchestra. So we're seeing change like that, but I have to say, the guilty candidates that are evidenced in, in the report, we can't even get in the room. And then you have to question, sorry, I'm gonna go off, yeah? 
you have to question, why is that? Gabriella nicely in her report asked the question. Well, she didn't ask. I know you know the answer, but you didn't put it in your report, so I'm going to say it for you. So she's, you know, she said in her um, executive summary, we're unsure why this is. <laughs> we all know why this is. And I, I, I'm, going to be, I'm going to hold back a little bit. I don't want to make an assumption. But we have to look at if there's a reason, an actual reason, why they're perpetrating this divide. Why women aren't actually getting commissions. Is there a reason? Because 1987, Women in Music, they pulled the funding. We're doing our work. Other organizations are doing their work. Gabriella's stunning reports for the last four years and we've not seen the needle move? Is there something happening here? Is there a, uh, and coming from a, the black perspective as well, you know, it, as you know, it's a far worse for us in, administrat in administration um, roles, as composers, as players, it's visible. Is there a reason for it? Are the white males in leadership protecting something? The 10 composers that we saw, are they protecting something? And I just want to put that out there because for me, a friend of mine always says, um, Paulette Long, you know, we're not seeing change, we're seeing movement. We're seeing an incy wincy bit of movement in this report. We need to see more. And I think we need to be bold and start actually asking the questions. As a critical friend to these leaders in the music industry, are you trying to protect something? Are you really trying to make a change? So that's my stance. Thanks, Rhys. I think we need to dare to ask the question, don't we? Um, I'm going to bring Stephen in now. Stephen joins us from City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, where he's responsible for all the activities of uh, the orchestra, plus its four choruses, its youth orchestra, its learning programme, its administration and the rehearsal home, CBSO Centre. So, Stephen, as a leader of an organisation that, um, that you, you know, you're in that leadership role and you have that power and decision-making gift, what are the conditions you need to drive change and um, how can you make that part of your longer-term strategy and planning? Uh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much. Um, I think you need, as has already been said, you need visible leadership from the top. Uh, that is a uh, necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition to make long-term change. In our case, you know, we have a, a conductor in Miga Grosini Tatila who kind of helped put another crack in the glass ceiling for conductors. Uh, here, our next chief conductor is our first non-European, uh, Kazuki Yamada, and our excellent head of artistic planning, uh, Anna Melville, has been involved in diversifying program for orchestras uh, on both sides of uh, the world. Um, I think more generally, there are three barriers that you have to overcome. Uh, the first is prejudice. Uh, for which there is no excuse, and actually we need to name and shame a bit more, perhaps. Uh, and frankly, also, you know, if as a programmer you're, you're not getting anywhere with the conductors you're working with or the soloists you're working with, hire different partners. Simple. You employ them. I think the second barrier is ignorance, to do with just knowledge of the repertoire. And obviously, this is now much easier than it used to be. I mean, I remember when I was getting into classical music, having to go and borrow records from the record library, all that sort of stuff. And of course, beyond that core canon, so little had been recorded. Now we all have YouTube, we all have Capital Music, we have Gabriella's excellent playlist there. There's much less excuse, but it takes time. And you need, you know, you need to select and really promote pieces that will be able to receive great performances because the artists who are doing them believe in them. What you don't want is music being done by people who don't believe in that music because actually you don't get great performances. And you have to keep playing them until they become standard repertoire. And the third barrier I think is the hardest, which is economics. Um, 
I think especially for orchestras reliant on box office, at CBSO, until the pandemic, we had the largest box office income of any orchestra in the country. And in general, as you, uh, most of the people in the room will know, British orchestras have to earn a lot, a lot larger percentage of their income from box office than is typical in the rest of Europe or, for instance, within the BBC. Um, and I think that the issue here is not to do with whether the repertoire is diverse or not. The issue is to do with whether it is yet known or not. 99% of the music written by dead white men is also unknown. And the issues really are the same. You have to choose well, be clever about how you program, back, it, back your decisions in how you have your PR and uh, uh, you know, your, your, your advocates talking about it. And you, and you have to really persist. Uh, and the reality is, you know, there are also plenty of pieces that are played a great deal, which can empty a hall really quickly. You know, con conductors, we really don't need another performance of the poem of ecstasy. Um, it, you know, if you, if you want to play out your sexual frustrations, do that in your own time and spare the musicians and the audiences from that. I think then uh, there's a fourth barrier, I think, for amateurs, which is to do with availability and the cost of materials. So when I've talked particularly to students, to amateur groups, they say, well, look, we'd love to play. We've, we tried to find out about this piece by, I don't know, Ruth Gibbs or whoever, uh, but actually we couldn't get a hold of the music. It's not published, it's not available, or it's hundreds and hundreds of pounds that we don't have. So I think that's, again, something where structurally within the sector we probably need to do more to help those people. Final point, if I may, is that I do think it is easier to change the future than to change the past. So it, it, what we've been doing at CBSO, a number of initiatives, including signing up to the PRS Foundation Key Change Initiative. So we've just commissioned uh, over the last few years 40 pieces to mark the CBSO centenary. Half of those were from women. Uh, we are making sure that, in terms of that audience piece, making sure that it is absolutely accessible for young people and new audiences to find their way to CBSO concerts, not by printing access codes at the back of the brochure in the smallest possible print and making conditions. If you want to come to a CBSO concert as, and you're a student or you're a child, any ticket bought any time in any part of the hall, five pounds. If you're under 30, it's 10 pounds. And that is visibly changing the audience that we have in Birmingham for classical music. Uh, and the final thing we're doing, which opens in a year's time, is the new Shyland CBSO Academy in Sandbar. So coming back to the music education piece that Deborah talked about, we are opening a non-selective comprehensive school in one of the poorest boroughs in the country that will have a music focus all the way through. And we, it's very exciting. The l last week we broke ground on the site. There are now builders and diggers and high-vis jackets. Very exciting. And on Saturday we had an open day and we were overwhelmed with families from Sandwell who have kids who are interested in music and want to be able to go to a school where music will not be at the margins and just something you do at lunchtime, but will be in the syllabus every day and with great opportunities free of charge. So we can change the future uh, even if we can't always change the past. Thanks. Um, I'm going to come back to all of you because I think there's supplementary questions for all that, but I also will encourage the audience to think about whether they want to ask some questions in a minute. Um, Eleanor, you're the Artistic Director of the LPO, who's, and your goal is about mirroring the values of the community and projects that bring people together to create and enjoy deep, meaningful explorations within musical genres. As an artistic programmer for an internationally renowned orchestra, how do you influence change within your organisation not to be that tick box exercise? And what conditions do you have to bring together to make it make that change lasting? Well, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be on such a panel of distinguished participants. Um, and this answer, uh, this question has been just answered by my colleagues very nicely. Um, uh, and uh, I would need to say the same if I wanted to go into the, um, you know, uh, describing the real conditions that prevent us from uh, programming certain things. But I would like to just turn it upside down for a moment, um, because my major issue with the current situation is um, uh, who we see in front of us when we um, talk about these issues. Look at this room. We are preaching to the choir, mostly. What if we change the name of this event to Men in Music? Can you 
first of all, imagine that. Never, right? It would never happen. But second, who would be here? Definitely not only us, right? So changing that equation uh, seems to be really essential to me. Um, uh, so um, I'm personally trying to talk about issues that we are discussing today at every possible level in um, every possible configuration of, uh, you know, people, uh, board members, musicians, uh, audience members, because they need to understand what we are seeing today. Um, they need to see those numbers as well. Uh, um, my major, my mantra, so to speak, has been the intentionality. We have to make our decisions intentionally, we have to present them intentionally, and we have to really seek out for what we think uh, should be done. Um, because right now, as you know very well, the uh, notion of classical music, uh, music canon is built on the notion of uh, meritocracy, which is very fraudulent on its own, because, uh, uh, you know, the main question when you look at the names on, on our programs is, why did we choose those people? Um, and the, the answer is usually, as we heard today, is that because they are the best, it's the best music. But who are we choosing from? You know, if we know that um, women who constitute the majority of the population pretty much everywhere, and definitely in the cities where classical music is flourishing, um, if they haven't been in the pool for us to select from, you know, they haven't been performed, they haven't been admitted to the concert stages as musicians for centuries, not just, you know, in the last couple of years. So how do we choose um, Beethoven uh, considering all these women? We can't, we haven't been given opportunities to actually think about who else existed at Beethoven's time. And maybe those people were, as good as he was, we simply don't know, right? So changing that uh, equation by constantly um, thinking that, you know, other people do exist and they need to have their um, voice in, um, in the society uh, is what's driving me personally. Um, and uh, just a few examples of what LPO has been doing uh, um, uh, recently. Um, uh, we are celebrating our 90th anniversary uh, this season and I arrived at the orchestra exactly a year ago and the first thing I realized um, was that um, uh, out of all um, hundreds of commissions that this orchestra has um, done over 90 years, they commissioned only one woman. One, that's the statistics that I saw. So we started changing it immediately, started changing the future. We can't change the past, unfortunately. So this season we are premiering six, six compositions by uh, women and uh, there are additional pieces that are pre-existing by uh, wonderful uh, women composers. I never want our PR to say, oh, that's a woman composer. She is a composer. They are composers, you know. Um, <laughs> thank you. But at the same time, we are counting. We need to change those numbers. So we are very uh, conscious about um, what we are programming. And um, just um, uh, one more quick example. I know we are running out of time. Uh, just last week, we uh, announced a new program, which is called uh, Conducting Fellowship, specifically for underrepresented conductors, because we know that um, it's not only in the world of composers that women are underrepresented. And of course, this world were underrepresented is also confusing and it includes much more than just women. Uh, but we are targeting that other half, or I should say the majority of the population that hasn't been included so far. Thank you. Um, just before I come to Ellie, I'm just gonna get the panel to think about what's one thing that they could leave the, the room with an example of one thing that everybody could take away from today to do differently to, to increase that kind of that lasting change opportunity. Um, Ellie uh, Consta is a violinist and founder of Her Ensemble, a string group which seeks to address the gender gap and gender stereotypes in the music industry. When you were setting up Her Ensemble, which I think was that during lockdown that you did that? Yeah, um, 
what was two the, years ago. Yeah, what was your, when you were setting that up, what was your approach to thinking about la the lasting change that you wanted to make? And as freelancers coming together, how does that affect you in terms of those conditions that you need to put in place as freelancers with, without the organisational structures behind you? Um, well, actually, it all started because I saw the statistic from Donne in 2019. I think it was 3.6% of the works performed uh, by orchestras worldwide were written by women. So that was one thing that really shocked me, the shock factor of the statistics. Um, but the second thing was uh, I was working with... Um, singer-songwriters and I started noticing the differences between the pop and the classical worlds um, and that also really shocked me um, so I guess it started by questioning things like why why is the dress code like this why are th why is this percentage of works being performed why do we do it this way can we do it another way so I think continuing to ask why um, and another big thing that I think people have already touched on is obviously all of these issues are societal um, and the music industry is no different it's like a tiny microcosm of broader society but um, the difference between scenes and I mean like I'm talking about classism um, I actually pulled out of a trial two months ago um, because of this um, yeah I think things like dress codes and the gender stereotypes that we see in the classical industry play a massive part in that and for people feeling like they can they it is accessible and they are included seeing people that look like us um yeah is really important but so i think maybe just coming back to that question of why are the dress codes gendered but binary gendered as well who does that exclude um I guess like zooming out and seeing like the bigger picture of things. Um, it, it was funny when we first, when we did our first photo shoot um, and it was like loads of women um, or like femme presenting people in suits and everyone was like really shocked. And I found that really like interesting. Like why is it so shocking when like in the same year in the pop industry, like that's not shocking, it's just fashion. So I think maybe like being a bit more in touch with broader society, which is inevitably going to be more inclusive. <laughs> maybe? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think there's there's so much great encouragement in this room, and as you said, we are we are talking to a room that is open to this. And I suppose one of the questions is, if you're thinking about what people can take away to perhaps to talk to somebody else about who's not in this room, who isn't in that position of feeling like they want to make that lasting change, or they they are, you know, brave enough, they're asking the right questions, they're 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 using the why word, which you know people seem to not like. Why why are we doing that? Why is that the case? What, what can you all give advice? Because everybody in this room will want to take away something from today. We've got the report, we've got evidence, we've got data. You're all producing research and evidence and data. But as, um, as we've heard already, we're in, we could be in a cycle. So how do you break that cycle? How do you make lasting change? What, what are the things that you've seen that could work? And from your examples, there's something also about sharing that knowledge as well, I think. Because if you're all doing great things, and you're making it possible. How do other people see the possibility in that? I'm going to start with you, Vic. I, I guess my, my top recommendation would be to read the research, to know the statistics, to know the data, because, because then y y you've got that evidence when you're in discussions and arguments with, with people which they, they can't deny. And the statistics are so grim and so shocking that, uh, you know, I think that, uh, that it would be a really good place. There's lots of fantastic research and researchers in this, in this room. Um, I set up a, um, a research hub, gender and music research hub through the, through the F list, and to bring, to bring together all of these researchers, because we really, you know, if we don't know where we are, how do we know where we, we need to get to? So that's my, my top tip. 
Thank you. Um, we're all part of this ecology, aren't we? So it kind of, when we, he we heard earlier on from ISM, it starts with education and it follows all the way through. And Ellie, I mean, you're an inspiration for the next generation as well. So what, what are the things that you can be doing as freelancers, as musicians coming together that could inspire that next generation to change, even with that context of music education as we know it is today? Um, I think two things. Uh, one that I have found uh, really helpful is social media, especially TikTok and Instagram connecting. I've connected with so many people, which is so nice, uh, bringing everyone on the same, yeah, same journey. Yeah. And um, I guess the second one, which is, uh, again, that why question, but who are we trying to appease? And I think I wanted to talk about, like, um, when we were talking about, like, uh, box office and tickets and selling stuff. Um, uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> um, In oh, terms yeah, of audiences. If you're, um, I don't think... I think that if we're worried about losing audiences, um, or it's not so much about losing audiences, but like um, it's going to be the same. It's like the same structure, the same people that you're trying to please, but um, you can bring in like a whole new audience and encourage more different, more diverse people to come and watch stuff instead of trying to appease like the same people. Mm. Because I think um, when we're talking about that, it's like, I think someone's already talked about it. I don't know how to express this, like the fear of losing, but like um, it's, it's still the fear of losing the same person. Like if, who are we thinking about? Again, like what do they look like? Yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, we've seen it in our high streets, we've seen it in our towns and cities as a reaction to coming out of COVID. We want something different from those places. We want experience and social activity and joining. And I think that, that kind of how you transpose that into our cultural buildings and our cultural offer, then there's another reason to bring people together. And I think that expansion of audience is something that, again, needs to be really unpacked a bit more. Because, as you say, we're not necessarily losing audiences, we're gaining audiences by a new experience. Sharice, from your perspective, I mean, you're on a campaigning trail and you're asking some challenging questions and you're using the why word wherever you can. So what, what have you found that's worked and what are some of the things that the kind of the members and the people have signed up to be part of Black Lives and Music? Why are they doing it? What, what's their motivation and what can you share around for other people in the room to know? Why do they care? Why have they made it matter? I mean, I think some, there are people, wonderful people like Ellie, you know, who's hit on the point, which is your point, the future. And, um, you know, this is a little bit obvious, but people are going to die, you know. <laughs> the audience, the audi people are going to die. The audience, that audience will eventually, you know, die off. So what's the new generation? What's the plan? You know, and I think... That's where the why question comes in again. You know, what are you doing? Why? I think um, to answer your question, what has worked? I don't want to make a rod for my own back, but I'm an honest person. I don't know. I don't know. Because we've been fighting. Black people have been fighting in the music industry for 40 years. As long as I've been alive. Black people in general you know, <laughs> have been fighting for equality for over 400 years. So, I don't know. But I think we're in an age, thankfully, because of a series of tragic events that we're able to see a bit more clearly. We have technology now, TikTok, social media. I believe we're in a state, we have the research, which is, you know, all of us are researchers, <laughs> lots of researchers in the room. We're at, we're at a stage where, we're, where we are without excuse. Gabriella has a database. Over 5,000? Yeah. It? Works from women. Yuchenna at the back, she has, uh, also has a database for black composers as well. I hope I got that right, Yuchenna. We're, at, we're, at, we're without excuse. We just are. So... 
I ask the question, we have to look at, is there something else going on? But we really, as individuals, have to make a concerted effort for integrity to make change. So my encouragement is if you're working in an organization, who can you partner with? There's people like Black Lives in Music, organizations like Black Lives in Music, but there are others as well that can help you take the first step to making lasting change because we are the lived experience. Um, I think you asked earlier on, um, Claire, you know, who needs to be in a room? We do. You said it as well. Someone said it on the last panel. We need to be in a room so we can tell you. And, and it, as an individual as well, there's a um, quote, and I'm going to steal this from a member of Black Lives and Music who's, who got it from Toni Morrison, so this is not my inspiration, but Toni Morrison says, resistance is the key to joy. In other words, we have to resist what's going on. And in the end, it will bring about freedom, it will bring about joy, and what we're trying to accomplish here, which is equality. We have to resist. That would be it. Thank you. And Stephen, when you're looking around other comparable orchestras around the UK and the world, how do you share the potential that it doesn't affect your bottom line, that it is a risk that you can take? Well, I, I, I think the um, what 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 Gabriella and Team's research does is give some actually firm data on these things and what, what is happening. There's that thing, I can't remember the, the name of the scientific effect where something changes because it's being observed, but it seems to me that is exactly what's happened here. And actually, I'm quite... Uh, I, I'm, I'm a glass half full kind of person and I, I'm quite encouraged by the progress in the numbers. So if you see three years ago, 2.3%, then 3.6%, then 5% last year and 7.7% this year of, of music uh, worldwide being played that's by women. That's a 50% increase each year on average. Uh, so by the 26-27 season, if we keep up that rate of progress, 59% of works written by women. Um, now, the next bit might be harder, but that is definite measurable progress. And I think what we need in this whole area is, uh, exactly as we do with employees, exactly as we do with a whole load of other areas, is, you know, you want to make sure that as well as the heat that there's going to be, and there's always going to be a lot of heat, that we're also getting some light as well. And I think what the data and the really robust way in which this survey has been compiled, and the really great way in which it's very shareable, we've, we've been sharing it last year, we'll be sharing it again this year, um, really allows us to encourage others. I think, just going back to your previous question, the reason we were, I think, possibly the first orchestra to sign up with Black Lives of Music, um, was because we, we know that we need help on these issues. We need advice. Roger Wilson, in particular, has been fantastically a uh, great partner for us, helping with recruitment. He's come and spoken to the whole orchestra and the board. And, you know, we are working with, with um, Blim on a re very regular basis as partners because, actually, you have to be humble enough to know what are the things that you don't know enough yourself and, and, and you, you, you need help on. And in the same way with composition, uh, this, this report is fantastically helpful. Uh, we all need to do better. We need to do better at CBSO. But we've got something we can measure which is much better than simply the noise of people's press releases landing every time they do something they're proud of and ignoring all the other times. Thanks. And finally, Eleanor, what's your kind of takeaway from today? Um, well, it's going to sound a little controversial, perhaps. Um, we have been talking as an industry a lot about diversity and inclusion, but I realized just now that, you know, um, that majority of the population shouldn't be a thing that need to be included, right? It's a majority. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I suppose we should go back to um, um, our workplaces or to our homes, to our communities and um, just insist on being um, 
not exclude it, you know, just reverse it and uh, do it in such a way that we are always there, we are present, we are part of um, our world. Thank you. So thank you very much to my panel. I'm really sorry, we don't have time for questions now, but I'm going to hand back over to Helen, who's going to do another panel. And maybe there'll be some question time at the end for everyone, because I think there's lots of concurrent themes in this. Thank you very much for all the panel. So I'm back again. Um, we're going to move to our third panel. So we started with lived experiences and voices from four amazing composers. And we've just really spoke about change and making that impactful uh, with experience as well. And the last panel also is an experiential voice. So we're going to have five speakers who are really going to be able to engage with us about supporting the change to develop diversity, equality, equity um, as well. So could I please invite to the stage our next speakers, Emma Gate, Elizabeth Sills, Ishani O'Connor, James Ainscoe and Joe Wilson, please. Hello, welcome. I will just let everybody sit down and get comfortable before I start. We will have some time for questions. And just to say, after this panel, we have an hour of networking. So if you've got a question you don't want to ask publicly, but you would like to ask one of the panel members, that we will be around networking. Please do you know, exchange contact details and ask those questions as well. So you will have some private time at the end. Welcome, thank you. I will stand at the side and not do what I did before and nearly fall off the edge. Um, <laughs> apologies. Um, so we're in a situation where we're talking about economic change. We're talking about breaking down prejudice and barriers to make meaningful long-term change. So we need to think about how we incentivize those leaders to make that change. What we can do, what we can do collectively to inspire, to incentivize that change. So it would be worth thinking about examples of uh, people resource or exchanging people financial experience resource, perhaps. So I'm wondering from you all, and I'll ask the question first before I start going in, but whether you've got any examples of how we could incentivize such change from these, the gatekeepers, if you will, the leaders, um, and what those might look like. Um, I'm just going to look at my list, if that's OK. And at the top of my list, I've got Emma. And I'm just wondering if I could turn to you and ask that question. Uh, sure. Hi, um, I'm Emma Gate. I'm one of the classical music programmers for the Barbican Centre. Um, it's been really interesting listening to everybody talk about, and particularly Nicola, talk about the cycles that we go through and the way that we make progress and then the clock ticks back. Because I think with an economic crisis looming or indeed upon us, this is a real moment of danger. And we need to not waste the investment that we've actually put in so far. Because we look at Gabriella's report, we see that some change has happened. There's a huge gravitational pull happening right now to tick that clock back and to lose what we've done so far. Um, so I think it's about investing our resources to shore up the ground that we've already made and go on from there, rather than to keep doing the same things again and again. Um, we've talked a lot about supporting living composers, composers are creating now. I think for organizations like the Barbican and like Stephen and Elena's orchestras that we've heard from. It's also about the, the dead composers, if I may. Um, there's a huge wealth of music by women and by composers of the global majority who are no longer with us. We, there's a danger that we assume that if we're going to program music by women or by composer of colour, that it's also going to be new, modern, and challenging, and therefore that goes in a different category from the, the nice music that the audiences will like. Personally, I think that's rubbish. Um, but we need to get to a point where the, the list of music that people love the most, the most loved classical music, includes pieces 
by women and includes pieces by composers of colour. And that means repeat performances. It doesn't just mean you commission. Commissioning is great. We need to do more of it. We need to make sure that our commissioning budgets are prioritised in an equitable way. But it's also about performing the pieces that we've commissioned again. And it's about going back into the repertoire that exists and bringing that repeatedly into our programmes and onto our radio stations and into our CD recordings. We want to be able to do building a library on Radio 3 about pieces by women because there's so many different recordings to choose from. Um, for me also as a, as a programmer, so somebody who invites artists to come and play, it's a, about asking the slightly uncomfortable question sometimes. Say, so I have, if there's any agents in the room that I've been talking to, you might have had an email from me where I say, yeah, I'd love to talk about what your artists might do. We are actively encouraging everybody who plays at the Barbican to include music by women and or non-binary composers and or composers of the global majority in their programmes. The responses I get are not always positive, to put it mildly, but sometimes they are. Sometimes they're surprisingly positive. So as well as working with the artists who make championing diverse repertoire a really explicit part of their practice, I think it's behoven on all of us who have resource to invest in programming artists to push the people who have not so far done the work to do the work. And we're in a position where we can do that. Gotta just ask the really awkward questions. Um, and that has, that has paid dividends in our, so we measure by the 22-23 uh, financial year I've looked at. 22% of the compositions in our program were by women. 17% were by composers of the global majority. That's not good enough, but it's a lot further than the global average. And the other thing that we need to do, and Arlene touched on this earlier, is then look at, well, you say, okay, well, we think we're doing better than everybody else, but let's slice and dice our data in the ways that will show us where we're doing worse than we should be. So say, okay, that looks great in terms of number of compositions. How many symphonies? How many concertos? And suddenly we're doing a lot worse, and that's sad, but that's what gives us the kick to focus our dwindling resources in those areas where we need to do the work. Thank you. And it's really important to really reflect, as you've just said, that data can be analysed in different ways. We can manipulate data for the positive. So actually then looking and asking the opposite question. So thank you for sharing that. It's really important. I will carry on around the room. And I'm just going down the list because I, I don't want to just go and do the same order as last time. But Elizabeth and Sills, can I ask you, and please do introduce where you're from as well as we go. I don't want to waste time giving your biography. I'll give my own biography then. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elizabeth Searles. I'm Grants and Programs Manager at PRS Foundation. We are the UK's leading funder of new music and talent development. Um, back to your original question, I would say um, we're all about creating opportunity through grant giving and funding schemes that we run. Um, Ten years ago, we set up Women Make Music as a response to the amount of applications that we were getting from women and underrepresented John, uh, genders in, for, fun, for funding. Um, so we set that up, um, and now 10 years later, we're at, uh, across all our funds in PRS Foundation, we are at 63% uh, women and underrepresented genders, and, and so that's a massive improvement. But we're not there yet. And I think we set up Women Make Music with the idea that in 10 years we wouldn't need this uh, because it would all be equal, uh, but we're still here. So it's about taking, it is taking responsibility. Um, and from Women Make Music came our global initiative, Key Change, uh, which helps um, um, music creators and music professionals um, internationally. And alongside with it has come with a pledge uh, to sign up for 50-50 uh, by 2022, which we are here, uh, and the report will be out in 2023. And it hasn't, and, and we have 12 orchestras. I looked yesterday that we have 12 orchestras signed up um, to the pledge, and it 
doesn't come without challenges, but the report will be out next year. Um, and it's really great to make that public pledge to say that you will be doing that. But it's, you know, it's still not enough. Um, and organizations like PRSF and others have to kind of look at things to see if we can counteract what's going on. We've noticed, I mean, we always export and look at all our grants and our statistics, uh, who's applying. And we've had, we've looked at since COVID, it has been significantly less in classical genres um, for women and underrepresented genders. So, you know, we look at that and then we need to go out and talk to people and find out why this is happening. Um, so it's all about building partnerships. We have talent development partners across the UK um, who represent all different kinds um, of music uh, creators and you know it's about having conferences and talking and talking to them and seeing what is going on in the industry and keeping asking as Claire mentioned why all the way all throughout all the work that we're doing thank you I think it's really important the heading out isn't it being active and making sure we speak to a wider range of people thank you really positive could I move to you Ishani next about how we can incentivize to make change um, hi, I'm Ishani O'Connor. I'm um, generally a learning manager. I worked for Chinookay Foundation as the learning participation manager for nearly five years. And I'm currently head of engagement for London Youth Choirs and doing some consultancy work um, on education programmes with English Chamber Orchestra. Um, so I think Donne is an incredible resource, and there are so many incredible resources out there. Like Sharice was saying earlier, there is no excuse anymore for not knowing, being ignorant, um, not making a commitment, a really solid, active commitment in funding, in programming. Um, all art takes risk. All art takes confidence and um, experimentation, and artists and um, musicians deserve the support that they need in order to become um, the greatest they can be. And my work with Chinake really showed me that um, when you give young talent a platform, when they are rising to that challenge, they really will excite, um, really kind of break the mold when it comes to classical music. And the reason why I joined Chinake was because when I was young, when I was choosing my pathway um, into professional music, I didn't see anyone that looked like me. I didn't see anyone in conservatoires that I walked around um, that I could look up to. There were no role, role models, really. Um, and I was actually thinking about um, when I was doing A-level music around sort of 17, 16, 17 years old, I wrote to BBC Radio 3 and asked them if they could play a piece of music, any piece of music by a female composer. It took them about two weeks to write back to me um, on, this is pre-email, um, on a, a paper letter with BBC Head and Note paper, basically telling me, well, search in the archives, it's gonna take a little bit longer. <laughs> and about a few months later, they told me that it was going to be on, in I can't remember which program it was, um, and it was uh, the French composer, Germaine Taillefer. And um, that was literally the only piece of music by a woman they could find at the time. This was the 1980s, <laughs> and they had the greatest resource they, that in you know, the whole country probably at the time. So I think we are at a point in history where the risks need to be taken, the money needs to be shown. I know that um, from working with orchestras, from talking to other organisations who work with orchestras, that everybody is nervous. But, I mean, I, I, looking at the proms audiences, the ones that I came to this year, and also um, watching them on TV, that there were packed houses. And um, a lot of those um, programmes were very experimental. Um, they involved communities. Um, you know, the BBC has an incredible resource, obviously and that's why they can take the risks. But why not create an incredible, exciting program that brings in audiences that you don't normally see? I, I don't understand it, I think it's a no-brainer. Hear, hear. Well said, well said. And actually, in, uh, in asking people to take risks, I would propose the opposite side of the coin, that if they don't make change, they're making a risk for themselves, they'll be left behind. 
So thank you. Really, really helpful. Having the range of experiences we've had on these panels that Gabrielle's put together is really useful to all of us. I'm finding I'm learning from listening as well, so thank you. Um, I'm going to move down the list to James. Um, we had a chat before, so I know this is going to be interesting, about um, how you would suggest we incentivize change. Thanks. I'm, I'm James. I run Help Musicians. Uh, so help musicians. So, so those of you who have been longer in the industry you know we, we used to be called the Musicians Benevolent Fund. So a uh, 101 year old charity. I've not run it for all of those years, just a few <laughs> recently. And um, we, we both support um, uh, artist development, so a similar style of work that Perez have to do. But we also do work on health and welfare issues, on mental health in particular, uh, and other things like that. And, so I, I've been sitting here trying to think what, 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 can I, what other perspective can I add to this conversation because we've heard such, such wise advice from, from all the panels so far. And I think one, one thing I wanted to say about how we approach our work at Health Musicians is that it's, the, the big headlines and the, and the broad sweep is very, very important. But actually a lot, a lot of the work is right down in the detail. So for example, it's, it's thinking through how we assess every single application in a fair way, making sure that we have no bias in any single assessment of any single application from any single artist that comes in. Uh, and so I need to pay tribute to Claire Gervais here. Claire worked for Helm Musicians for a number of years and we worked together for a few, which were very enjoyable years for me and she did a lot of work on this. So um, f focusing on things like that. Secondly, uh, making sure that as we develop support programs for, for musicians, that we, we start thinking about uh, uh, EDI issues from before we decide what we're gonna do all the way through to um, d delivering it. Because there's a danger that you, you decide what you're gonna do and you, you create it, and then you kind of say to your comms people, can you make sure that women also hear about this stuff, please? Um, but actually, if you start with, well, what, wh where is the need? What, what ought we to be doing? In what manner ought we to do it? With what words and, uh, and in what style should we prepare this support? And then how do we get it delivered to the right people? You find that it's much more impactful. So there's a, there's a lot of work down in the detail. Also the detail of identifying the most impactful opportunities to, to put some money or some time in. Um, so it's not always uh, the most uh, obvious or the most glamorous things. You know, one project I'm, I'm so proud of us working on at the moment is with, uh, in fact, with, with F-List, uh, you heard from Vic Bain earlier, uh, and Miloka Studios, trying to encourage uh, more women to go into studio engineering because that's a, uh, it, it, it's quite a niche area of the music industry, um, but there is uh, an almost complete absence of women, certainly at the top. There's some notable exceptions and, and very inspiring people. Uh, but so, so we, we can do the, the, the detailed work of, of lasering in on specific areas to go and do th something quite special. Um, the, de the detailed work of just spotting opportunities that arise as, as they come along. Actually, one, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, I wasn't coming here to, to say, but um, uh, there's uh, been an award for composers called the Mendelssohn Award, uh, which was founded in uh, 1856. Uh, and it's been, it's been trundling along, and, and we've, uh, we were approached actually by the trustees of it last year and asked if we could take over the, the administration and the running of it, which we're, which we're thrilled to do. And I mention it because um, one of the winners of the award uh, from 1972, I think, Nicola, uh, you received it. Um, Nicola is one, uh, it's been going since 1856. Nicola is one of six women who've won it over that period of time. So Nicola, it shows how good you are that actually you managed to <laughs> blow that particular door open. So again, we, we can spot opportunities like that and, and any particular one won't, won't change the world, but the, the more we can be laser focused, down in the detail, making sure that everything works right, um, I, I think that's the thing that I can, I can add to this. I, and the reason I, I, I say it is that we can't all make big headlines. We can't all get on the front page of, of something and, and use our voices. Those that do, we love it when, when you do that. And, and Gabino, you know, your report creates another moment when that can happen. Um, but for, for those of us who, who don't have those opportunities, down in the detail of, of each minute of our lives, when we're making decisions, when we're getting our work done, we can be factoring in uh, the right decision making, the right process, challenging our own uh, decisions and our own thinking. And I think that is part of how we make change as well. Thank you. Holding ourselves accountable is definitely something we're all aiming to do. Last but not least, we've had lots of voices in the room from a different 
careers, performers, composers, leaders in the field, and it's important we also have broadcasting. Joe, please, how can we incentivize, incentivize get the word right, to change? <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Jo Wilson from Scala Radio, head of music there. Um, I mean, I think as far as radio is concerned, um, media partnerships has been is a key thing. I mean, our relationship with Donna has been the last couple of years. I only met Gabriella the first time in real life last week, but we've been going for a couple of years. And uh, apart from anything else, it's been a really great thing for us because um, the repertoire that has been introduced to our regular playlist through that partnership. Scala has always been keen on being um, diverse and uh, interesting and varied and un uh, unpredictable. So um, it's always been part of what we wanted to do, but this partnership gave us a chance to kind of take that to another level. So that, that's, that's been great. Um, I, I feel like I'm in a sort of slightly more positive little bubble with Scala because um, because of the kind of music that we play, there's a lot of contemporary music, but also we uh, we delve into kind of back catalogue as well. There's um, uh, across my desk, particularly in <laughs> this, this, these few weeks, I'm noticing a huge amount of the new releases that are coming in are, are women composers. There's actually a label launching today, which some of you may know, um, called La Boite à Pépite, forgive my accent, I think that means the jewellery box, um, and it's devoted entirely, it's going to be in, devoted entirely to releasing works by women composers, undiscovered works, so today they're releasing, a, I think it's a three CD box set of music by Charlotte Sowey. Uh, it's going to be our album of the weekend this weekend. Um, there's also a new recording of Florence Price, Filing a Jet Number 2, which we're featuring. There's also loads of singles, I mean, I think there's... Um, so many labels out there. Obviously, there's the majors, but no, many, many indies. And um, there's a lot of singles. And I'm going to say this not just because I know they're here, but Sony have got quite a lot of um, singles coming out at the moment by, uh, led by women, um, of women. So Esther Abrami has an EP um, uh, coming out and some singles already released by Amelia Warner, um, Shirley J. Thompson, and so forth. And th this is all stuff that fits in really well with what we do. So, I mean, our audience... Um, it's a commercial classical station, and we also play slightly around that. But it's um, it's accessible, but that's you know, uh, but it's still totally doable. Uh, and there's it's very easy for us to proactively um, program the the women composers in amongst uh, which will be less familiar in amongst the familiar. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things I wonder about, I mean, I know logistically it's easier for me to curate an hour of music or a show. And, and do that than it is for a, um, a concert programmer to, to make that happen in, in the concert hall. But I feel, and it's been touched on already, you have your, your familiar, you mix it in with the unfamiliar, can, you, can that not proactively, until the ship has turned a bit, can that not always proactively be a woman composer? Here, here, well said, thank you. It's a privilege to hear all the experiences of our panel so far, but I'm about to open it up for the floor for questions. You might have questions for this panel. You might also want to share examples of incentives of change. If it's not a question, it could be a statement and a sharing as well. That would be really positive. Or the panel may even have questions to share as well. I'm just going to take a moment to walk out onto the floor and smile at hands. Thank you. Thank you for a really illuminating panel. Um, Emma, I was wondering where you were saying that uh, when you said we're actually proactively doing something about our programming and responses have not always been positive, particularly thinking about the people who might not be in the room right now. I assume maybe they'd, they'd come from that group. But um, I'm curious if you could, if you'd be able to elaborate a little on what their reasons are, because I'm really curious about what people still think is acceptable to give <laughs> as a possible reason for not doing what you're doing. Um, so I, I guess there's kind of two main categories of the negative response. One has been, I'm not doing, or you know, my artist is not doing anything except these works this season. And sure, look, repertoire is a very, very personal choice. We all know that. But if you pick your same recital, pick a recital program to tour each season, and then every year it still only works by dead white men, that's a problem. Um, then the other, the other barrier sometimes is an economic one. And uh, you know, Stephen touched on this. Um, orchestras, when they tour, 
need to rehearse a program and they need to take it to a bunch of different promoters. If only one promoter on that tour wants a diverse program, then either you're bound to the common, de common denominator or as that one promoter, you're effectively paying a premium for the rehearsal time that goes into preparing that piece that isn't going to form part of the rest of the tour. Um, and I think that's something where, as promoters, we can try and use our influence. A lot of you will have probably skimmed the report as I did and noticed the difference between the way that British orchestras and American orchestras are performing compared to most European orchestras. And I think when we're talking about putting together a tour and so the venues that these programs may well be going to, I think that speaks volumes for the kind of culture that we're dealing with. And this is all part of a worldwide ecosystem. Um, so um, it's behoven on people like me and everybody else to keep pushing our colleagues to keep being critical friends so that we don't have that. We, we're not in that position where the economics are a barrier to doing what's right. We need to, and many of the panelists have touched on this, to trust the audiences to vote with their pounds and with their feet and to show us that actually if we program in a more diverse, more inclusive way, we're not going to lose a bunch of money on it. Thank you. James. Can I just uh, add a few comments on that, which I, I fully agree with everything you, you've said. And I mean, I spent 10 years working here at the Royal Albert Hall. And it was very clear when um, the, the wonderful prom season came around each year, it was very clear from how the tickets sold that uh, the, the majority of the audience were actually choosing a concert based on who was performing, not what they were performing. Um, and it's not always the case. I mean, I have some favorite composers that I would listen to almost anybody perform. But, uh, I mean, you know, you, you could have, if Bernard Heitink said he was going to conduct the Bay City Rollers, I think you would have sold out the Royal Albert Hall. People would have come because it was, was Heitink. And so actually, the, the importance of advocacy right from the top, of, of uh, key conductors, key soloists saying, I will perform these works. And then actually enthusing about those works. So, so it's not just I will perform them, but you, you've got to come and hear because this work, this work is brilliant. This, this concerto by whoever uh, is, is the most stunning piece and I want you all to hear it. When you hear those voices coming through, uh, that, that um, completely undermines the, this economics argument that the audience will come if the voices they trust tell them they're going to have a great time. So it's also really uh, wonderful to see all the work Scala does because Scala as a station and many of the presenters on it use that kind of platform for, for positive advocacy and it tells audiences uh, who trust them, that they can go in and really enjoy concerts. Um, and I, if I can add a, an, another comment, because you, you just men mentioned the kind of the, the music ecosystem, and it, and it does make me think about the culture in the music industry and change that still needs to happen there. Uh, we, we, I don't think we necessarily have a culture that uh, makes it easy for musicians to work. There, there's a lot of competitiveness and a lot of unnecessary criticism on ha and harsh criticism that goes on. Um, and also, I mean, um, that we, we still work in a culture where there's bullying and harassment that goes on. And, and ISM released, a, a, released a, a fundamental report yesterday that showed how significant that still is. And so actually there's, there's, there's wider cultural change that we, that we need to affect. Um, and also, if you're going and, 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 uh, the, the other point to make around all that is you, you can't fix one problem and then do the other ones later. So, so we have to think about fixing issues of bullying and issues of misogyny and issues of racism and actually issues of socioeconomic access, which does start in education. We have to fix all those things at the same time because if you fix one and others remain, um, it, you, you, don't, you don't get to the level that you need to get to in order for it to be a, a, a fair playing field. And again, that, that comes back to both the, the detailed work of each individual in each organization doing its stuff, but it does rely on advocates, um, the top composers, the top performers, the top voices, um, all weighing in and saying what, what the world should be like and encouraging all, us all to move in that direction. Um, hi. <laughs> um, yeah, there's been quite a lot of talk today about kind of how to get audiences in to see something that they might not have heard about before, which I find quite an interesting concept because 
So I'm a harpist and I have an account where I show how the harp can be used in pop music, which when I started it, I thought no one's going to have any interest in this because the harp's kind of an instrument that not many people choose to search into a search engine anyway, and um, especially not for pop music. And then as I started posting and kind of looking at the comment section, it was not filled with people saying, I don't want to hear this. It was just filled with people saying, I never had thought of this happening before and this combination being used. So I guess my question is, with everything that's been said about kind of what needs to change, what do you think are kind of the next approaches into how to get all this information out there to new audiences and to young audiences, um, especially with like this incredibly fascinating information we've had this morning from the kind of studies that have been done. What's the approach to, to get this to younger audiences? Is it through social media or is it through kind of getting voices that, that younger people really respect and love to listen to to talk about it. So it's, yeah, it's kind of how do we take this incredible information and research that's been done and make it, I don't know if mainstream is the right word, but just in front of the right audiences to show them that actually change is possible and there's all these new exciting things that they haven't heard of and there's space for the composers that already exist, but there's also so much space for the new compositions coming in. Yeah, that's my question. <laughs> I can say a few things on it, but I don't want to be the one who keeps speaking, so I'll let the panel members go first. I mean, I, just coming from my perspective of education, I think that's where it starts, and we all know at the moment music education in schools is at a low ebb, um, that teachers don't feel qualified, um, they don't get enough um, resources and attention. Um, I'm working very sort of piecemeal with music hubs and schools um, around London, around England, um, and if young people are not given the chance to explore music that is not in the canon, shall we say, I, mean, I can't think of a, a better term, but I, I think the enthusiasm and the energy that young people will bring, and you know, thinking about soloists who are the star players who are going to draw audiences in, they can choose not to play um, Elgar Cello Concerto again. Um, they can choose to play music that they explore, they research, that they really um, commit to and, and feel a connection with, whether that's a contemporary woman composer or a woman um, composer who's been completely neglected. I think they have a, a duty as well, and we're talking about the ecology, so um, the amount of times um, Florence B. Price has been played on the radio has immediately um, made an effect for orchestras to, it, it kind of gives it credibility or something. I think it's, it really is about educating from the very beginning with young children. Um, at the moment, we have a problem with young children not even participating in music, let alone being able to learn an instrument and let alone being able to go to conservatoire. So, you know, that, that is the basic level. Um, but I, I, I really believe that um, this is no longer a minority issue. This is something that you know, we, we always say diversity and inclusion affects everybody. It benefits everybody. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of the way this will evolve, 52% um, of the world's um, population are female. Why can't we reflect that in the programming? Here, here. I'm about to be very unpopular because I'm being boring with the time. I can see there are seven questions in the room and I know I'm being given the clock time call. So I'm just going to remind us all, we have a networking time now for 15 minutes. You will have an opportunity to raise your questions. I can see one over there, one down there, two behind me, and one at the side. So apologies, but with time, I know there's pressure, but you will get a chance to speak to the panel members. We have the networking opportunity. Can I just take a moment to say thank you to our third panel members one last time. And just before I ask Gabby to get to the stage, there's many reports being released, and I just want to make sure we're all aware of one more report. Thank you so much. Again, um, just reiterating the report that... Thank you so much, James. Dignity at Work, Discrimination in the Music Sector. It is a truly harrowing read. We all need to read it. The situation is getting worse. 
And I just go, want to go back to what Emma said. We are at a dangerous point and we have to hold on to what we've got in order to go forward. So please read this report. Please share it with everyone you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. No, you can stay, go, stay. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you once again, everybody who took part. Uh, sorry the time is short, but I, 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 I really hope that we have some time now to, to be in the room and talk to each other. So forgive me for being the, the clock manager. <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, I just wanted to end it with a, a phrase that Ishani told me the day I met her, actually, a couple of weeks ago, and she said, uh, well, I know what I'm doing to support equality and diversity. Do you? <laughs> Thank God I did. <laughs> but um, the question is also, we have to remember that support, the support cannot only happen in March. It can only be a concert or one event a year. You can't just be putting women in one concert as if they are a special category but it means including this music and their works every day in everything we do. And if you do not do what else you can do, do support us, <laughs> do join us and help us to continue to do the work that we do. The Donny Foundation has no regular funding, but what we do have is an amazing network of composers, specialists, researchers, academics, performers around the world. And we have created a series of memberships that we invite you all to choose one and join, invite your friends. And especially all the orchestras involved in the study and listed here and all the orchestras around the world, do sign in, do get in touch with us. I once again, I already have people just waiting to get uh, the contact to start working with you. And I'm sure that together we can create some very, very exciting future programs. Uh, and I am positive this can happen. Also corporate sponsors, we have some fantastic uh, opportunities coming up in the future and we would love to partner up with some of you. Um, a couple of weeks ago, well, I, actually, I just have to quote Viola Davis on this. I have to, because <laughs> I saw a video by her, actually, and she said, if you're committed uh, to diversity, if you're committed to creating change, let it cost you something. And by cost you something, I mean now, it doesn't mean financially only, but by all means, support us financially, please. But it means spend time, spend time to learn more, to find out more things, and most importantly, to influence people around you, influence decision makers, because we have to remember that being privileged is not only being rich, but is the color of our my skin, is our gender, and there's so many ways we can help to lift others. I was uh, in an event last week at Sony, such a lovely event, and a couple of people came to me and asked me, where do you find the energy to keep going? <laughs> Don't you think of giving up? Well, anyway, uh, some people here know that all the work I do for the foundation is unpaid. I don't have a salary for four years and a half, and everything I do is done parallel to my singing career, whilst I try to remain sane, although now it's quite debatable at this moment, I must say. <laughs> but where do I find my energy? I'm in touch with more than 3,000 women composers around the world. And they write to me, and I discover amazing music almost on a daily basis. And sometimes they tell me stories about not getting representation because they are too old. And sometimes they come just as a simple thank you. And these messages come regularly. Where do I find my energy? Most of all, for not being able to unsee what I have seen. And that is that we have an exquisite amount of talent around us, 
being neglected and feeling invisible. And they should not and they cannot be ignored any longer. It's been said many times, but the only thing that keeps women and people from the global majority from winning an Ivers, an Oscar, the CD of the year, a job, a movie credit, is opportunities. And these opportunities can never be hers or theirs if the music industry doesn't give space for the audiences to hear their music, to be familiar with their music, to give them the chance to have familiarity. Because only then, only then, maybe we have a chance. And we can't, in the meantime, as Charisse said, confuse movement with progress. Because there's a lot of movement happening. There's so many people doing amazing work. There's so many people overworked, tired, passionate, and they might just give up sometimes because it's too much. But we can't confuse all this movement with progress because progress will only happen when all the big guys join us and make this change happen with us. I stand here and I promise you, I will do everything in my capacity to not let these women down and all these amazing artists. And I really hope you can join me. Thank you so much. Stop it. Thank you. Thank you. Don't make me cry. Have um, a deep breath, Gabriella. Uh, do two Have things a deep I breath. forgot. I forgot. Please, uh, uh, going back to the lovely harpist, Olivia, is it? So, uh, take selfies in front of these posters, please. <laughs> and tag us. No, I'm not, co I'm not kidding. Uh, tag us everywhere in social media. Tell this story. Make a reel. Make a TikTok. I don't care. Take a picture of the thing. And because we need... The new generation is ready, I can tell you that. And they are really hang hungry to hear stories like that. And the other thing, you should all receive a copy of the press release and the PDF of the report by email at 1 o'clock is scheduled. Again, share with people of the press, with people you need, with all the orchestras that got 0%, and there are lots of them. Uh, and, and anyway, thank you so much. I'll see you for coffee. And I'm just going to add... <laughs> we don't all have a microphone, so I'm taking the liberty to speak for all of us. Thank you, Gabriella, for your inspiration, your hard work, and your leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, coffee. <laughs> or, or vodka.